Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. And we have a classic today because we're going to be learning about the 1970 film Waterloo. To help us separate fact from fiction, I'm excited to be joined by a historian and professor at Louisiana State University, Alexander Mika Berita. He's also written numerous books on the Napoleonic era, including his latest, which is called The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History. Before we connect with Alexander, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. Now, if you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true. <laughs> that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one. Casualties for Napoleon's army at Waterloo tallied up to over half of his army. Number two, Napoleon was still an emperor when he was exiled to Elba. Number three, Napoleon was mortally wounded at the Battle of Waterloo. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Alexander Mika Berita about the historical accuracy of Waterloo. Let's start the same way the movie does by setting up the events prior to the film's timeline. According to some text on the screen, Napoleon became the emperor of the French in just a few brief years. Then in 1812, his 15 years of victory came to a halt during the Russian campaign. The next year, in 1813, he was defeated by the combined forces of Austria, Russia, Prussia, and England at Leipzig. And from there, he was driven to Paris. And that's where the movie begins in the year 1814. How well does the movie do setting up Napoleon's career up until 1814? The movie uh, doesn't really give you a sense of his career. It's a uh, quick introduction to to what Napoleon accomplished. But it opens with this powerful scene, probably one of the most famous scenes in modern history, a scene that has been the subject of many paintings by Montfort and others. And it is a scene of Napoleon being confronted by his marshals, a group of military officers that he has elevated to the highest positions, uh, position in the French military. And one of the things Napoleon did as part of his reforms was to create, to revive the institute of the marshal of France. And over the periods of these previous 14 years, he has, or 10 years to be precise, he has created 26 of these marshals. And these were the, the men who carried the, you know, the legions of, of the French army, so to speak, to the various corners of Europe and who were the spearhead of Napoleon's conquests. But 10 years later, you can see, and I think the movie conveys that sense of exhaustion and fatigue that these generals have. They have become very uh, both uh, successful and rich, but also tired of this constant campaigning. And I always always tell my students that anyone who has gone uh, to Russia in 1812 and survived and came back home probably would <laughs> Didn't want to, didn't want to see another battlefield again. And then on top of it, as you mentioned, there was a fighting in 1813 and 14. So these men want peace. And so the movie opens with a scene where the Napoleon is confronted by these marshals who tell him it's time to stop. It's time to negotiate. It's time for you to go. And he tries to push back and he tries to say, no, I'm the emperor. I have made you. And then these marshals tell you, that's it. You, your time is over. And what I love about this opening scene is that once Napoleon agrees to abdicate and he agrees to leave, he leaves the room and all of this entire scene is taking place in the palace of Fontainebleau, the wonderful royal palace that Napoleon turned into his residence. And there, uh, the movie does a really great job at recreating the scene of his famous farewell to his imperial guard. You see this courtyard, you see the troops lined up there, and Napoleon gives that speech. And uh, the the movie actually repeated his speech, uh, the actual speech, almost verbatim. And you see the sense of, of the historical importance. And there are even the, the, the contemporaries talk about some soldiers crying and shedding tears. And, and you see that in a, a recreated, you know, reenacted in, in the movie as well. Yeah, I really got the sense that his men 
loved him because, you, yeah, you saw some of that emotion on the face of the soldiers as he was giving that speech. Indeed. And these are not just any kind of soldiers. This is the elite of the Grand Armée, the great French army, the Imperial Guard. Napoleon always treated military as an elite in society, and the Imperial uh, Guard was the elite within this elite. For them, Napoleon was indeed a man to look up to, and now to see him defeated and, uh, and cast aside, so to speak, uh, was, of course, a very emotional scene for them. And, and for many others, which is one of the reasons why Napoleon will be able to make a comeback in less than a year after being defeated and exiled. <laughs> We, we will get to that. I did want to ask you about the exile because in the movie, there, we kind of get some inner monologue in Napoleon's head. And one of those, he's like, why Elba? But the movie doesn't really explain that. So I thought I would ask that same thing. Why was Elba chosen for Napoleon's exile? That's a great question. And it goes back to this conundrum that the Allies, when Napoleon was defeated, he was defeated by the combined efforts of European powers, which included Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. So this big four powers, the allies, um, are facing this issue of what to do with Napoleon, because they have recognized him as the head of state. They have made deals with him, negotiated with him and all, but they also fought and clearly, you know, defeated and, and prevailed over him. But there are no, no grounds, uh, legal grounds for simply putting him in prison or shooting him or <laughs> any, any one of those uh, extreme cases. You know, they didn't want to make a martyr of him by essentially getting rid of him uh, in, in a violent manner. And so ultimately, at the uh, suggestion of the Russian emperor, it was agreed that it might be better to simply exile him to uh, some periphery and just let him be there. And Elba seemed to be like a nice kind of option where they could keep an eye on him, where they could give him uh, really the basic comforts because Napoleon's exile to the first exile to the to this island of Elba was actually quite a nice arrangement in the sense that the defeated emperor was given a handsome salary, two million francs a year that the French monarchy was supposed to pay him. He was allowed to retreat to this island and retain the title of an emperor. And even though this was the man who ruled much of Europe and now he's reduced to the ruling the speck of an island in the middle of Mediterranean, almost middle of Tyrrhenian Sea. And then he was allowed to have an army and even the semblance of a fleet. So, I mean, Napoleon even had his own uh, flag, uh, this white canvas with a red band with three golden bees on it. So he has all the traffics of sovereignty, except that he rules the, the island the size of my university campus. <laughs> that's the downside. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. I had no idea that he was, I mean, he was still, he was in exile, but essentially he was still an emperor. That's right. And that's where this, uh, there is this long, for a long time, right? Uh, we, we've been uh, in popular imagination. This was, you know, Napoleon escaped and, you know, Napoleon, you know, some kind of sneakily left the island. Technically, he was free to leave. <laughs> it was not advisable to leave so shortly after uh, being defeated. Uh, but as a sovereign uh, of Elba, he he'd certainly leave the island now, returning to France <laughs> against the wishes of a French <laughs> monarchy. Now that was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do see that in the movie, it, and according to the movie, it, it says that it happens ten months after he's exiled on Elba. He comes back with less than a thousand men and, and invades the mainland of Europe, and then in eighteen fifteen. We see Napoleon being greeted by cheers. There's happy crowds. Uh, there's even a scene where Marshal Ney's soldiers refuse to shoot Napoleon. He stands right in front of them. He'll shoot your emperor. And uh, instead, they all join his army. And meanwhile, we see King Louis XVIII saying something like, perhaps the people will let me go as they let him come. So overall, I got the impression that the French people love Napoleon. They welcome him back and, and essentially just kind of kick Louis out. <laughs> Is that true? No. Um uh, or at least we can say that it's partially true. So we know that when Napoleon was defeated and was exiled, the Bourbon monarchy, which has been in exile from France since 1789, 1790, the brothers of the last king, uh, the two brothers he had, uh, uh, Comte d'Artois and Comte Provence, uh, lived in the exile for a better part of quarter of a century. 
and they fought against revolutionary France and they fought against Napoleonic France. So we talk about a group of people, right, led by this now new king, Louis XVIII, previously Comte de Provence, who spent more than two decades confronting and fighting, and now they're back in charge. And so there is a gap uh, in terms of perceptions, attitudes, even expectations between the the newly returned uh, king and the the coterie, you know, this, this group of people that surround him, and the vast, vast majority of the Frenchmen who may not be content with Napoleon in 1814, and they are tired of war, they are tired of taxes, they are tired of conscription, they want peace. But they neither. But on the other hand, they don't want to get rid of the the great achievements that Napoleon brought to France, the uh, consolidation of revolutionary gains, the efficient government, the great reforms in Napoleonic code, you know, it, the, th- the things that Napoleon is justly commended on is still, right? There are two sides to this man. But when Napoleon is exiled, what, what we see is this, the problem of how do you reconcile the old government, effectively the Bourbon government that comes to France, with the new reality on the ground. And now the, the king, Louis XVIII, tried to maintain this middle ground where he said, well, can't simply turn the clock back and go to the good old days between before the 1789, before the revolution, before Napoleon. 25 years separate us from that, and much has happened. So we have to accept new conditions on the ground. But unfortunately, the king is surrounded by what we call ultras, the ultra-royalists, you know, the, uh, the, the people who are more royalists than the king, who believe that the system has to be restored as it was before. They wanted their privileges. They wanted the old way. And their attempts to indeed tweak the Napoleonic system, the legacy of the French Revolution, caused a lot of dis- disgruntlement. Now, imagine if you are a person living in France and you bought property that was forfeited by the nobles who fled from France or property that was confiscated from the church. And now this new Bourbon government speaks about restitution or some kind of uh, compensation for that property. You are concerned about it. Or if you are a person who has benefited from the revolutionary promise of uh, basic rights and freedoms, and here comes the people who actually don't believe in revolutionary deals, you feel that your standing in society might be threatened. And it certainly didn't help that the Bourbons started to just to downsize the French military. Now, we, are, we might understand why, right? France is a defeated power. He doesn't need a massive army anymore. It wants to show to the rest of Europe that the, the warring days are over. We want to be at peace. But that's not much of a solace for a soldier or an officer who is now who spent the last 20 years fighting under Napoleon, who has been to almost all major capitals of Europe except for London, who has been triumphantly you know, doing so, and then now he's told, that's it, we don't need you anymore, and cast aside, thrown into the street. And here you see this sense of um, among, the, uh, among the military men that France used to be great, it has fallen down, and this new government does nothing about it, and wouldn't it be wonderful to have France uh, great again, right? This kind of narrative of reviving French greatness. And they clearly have no hope for this government because the king can't even get on a horse. He, he he is suffering from a medical condition. He barely can move. And so we therefore go from Napoleon, this man of action, you know, god of war, to a guy who can barely ride a horse. Uh, and so this juxtaposition of how far we have fallen will contribute to the increased popularity of Napoleon, which is amazing. In 1814... No one really wants him <laughs> around. In 1815, people are like, mm, he wasn't that bad. <laughs> Maybe we can give him another chance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, as you were saying that, the I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is what you were just saying a moment ago, where the marshals were like, we're tired of war. We just want to stop. And then now it sounds like, oh, we stopped. Wait a minute. Wait, no, let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> now, the scene in the movie, uh, about, 20, about 20 minutes into the movie, when Napoleon uh, comes back, that is, to me, one of the most powerful moments in, in modern history because here you see one man, Napoleon, taking on the whole country. It's very well reenacted based on historical event which took place in March in uh, at, at a small village of La Frey in southern France. 
And indeed, as the movie shows, Napoleon has about a thousand men, and he uh, he's moving across the mountains. And to go back to your question, then, uh, is that Napoleon knew that he was not universally welcomed in France. He knew that there were a, a lot of people who didn't want him, not just because necessarily that he didn't like what he stood for, but rather they realized that Napoleon's return meant war, and people simply didn't want another war for this. And so there was indeed this popular kind of response to it where entire uh, areas didn't want him to pass through. And so what Napoleon did is he carefully navigated around those villages and had to move through remote areas across the mountains. And so the movie shows you Napoleon crossing this one of these mountains and coming across the royalist detachment, about 5,000 men. Now, the movie conflates, however, two separate incidents here. Marshal Ney is not present at Lafrey. He will switch the sides a few days later. But uh, for the sense of, you know, both narrative and, and you know, the enjoyment, I think they, they just condense this. And Ney is present now at Lafrey in the movie. But the rest of it is very well reenacted. And I love the scene when Napoleon, uh, so well, uh, you know, so uh, a- excellently portrayed by the actor, is, uh, is walking, right, slowly towards the, the royalist detachment and he leaves his thousand men behind and is actually alone, right, moves towards this army and he stands there and imagine, I cannot frankly imagine any other historical personality in, in modern history who can just walk in front of an army alone and give a speech, right, now granted this were the days of medicine, right, where <laughs> you can actually give a speech. <laughs> and he famously gives that speech, right? Soldiers of the 5th Regiment, I've heard your grumbles, and, you know, I've, I've come back, and here I am, and, and if you want to shoot your emperor, right, your man, the man who carried you everywhere, and, you know, who stands for that vision of, of the great France, here I am, shoot me. You see that emotion among the soldiers. Because you don't want to be in, in their shoes. Because here, in, the, in a matter of seconds, they have to make a remarkable decision. Do they stay loyal to the Bourbon government and shoot this guy? And that's the only thing you need. There's one you know, nervous finger on the trigger. <laughs> one shot, the man is dead, we go home. <laughs> or you give up on your loyalty to the Bourbons and switch and support this man. Not knowing what the future has for you. And then, and I love that touch where one of the soldiers, right, is is under such pressure that he passes out. Remember, yeah. <laughs> like I can hate oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But ultimately, they 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 are uh, the soldiers carry the day. Even though in, in, we know that you know, as, as as the movie shows, the officer orders to fire. The soldiers refuse to follow the order. Instead, they drop their weapons, rush, and embrace Napoleon. What a what a powerful scene. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so much pressure that those soldiers had to have been under to make that decision, essentially, to which government are we going to back? That's right. Yeah. I mean, your entire life, I mean, literally, the life is about to be decided and you have to make, you know, know, roll the die. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Well, once Napoleon is back in power in the movie, we he finds out that Wellington and Blucher's armies have been separated. It's, It's a June of 1815. And Napoleon decides to lead his army to Belgium in hopes of defeating Wellington's army there. And this is another part where I felt the movie was kind of rushing the explanation. I think there's one line of dialogue where Napoleon says something like, everything will depend on one big battle just like it did at Marengo. Of course, the movie doesn't show us what happened, (laughs) and it doesn't really give an explanation as to why Napoleon is willing to travel to Belgium to beat Wellington. So can you give us some more historical context around why Napoleon was so focused on defeating Wellington and how it was related to whatever happened at Marengo? So Napoleon returned in France in March. It only took him 20 days from landing in the south of France, not far from Cannes, from Nice, um, to Paris without shooting a single shot. It's, it's one of those remarkable events, really. The, the flight of the eagle, as sometimes it is referred to, a man uh, taking on the country and actually prevailing. But once he gets to Paris, once he took bloodlessly this country, then he is confronted by the situation that the rest of Europe has rejected him. Now, at the end of Napoleonic Wars in 1814, right, when Napoleon was first defeated, the great powers that defeated him 
decided to get together in the city of Vienna in Austria to decide the future of Europe. Since they have been fighting Napoleon for a long time, and Napoleon introduced a lot of changes in Europe, now these powers have to decide and uh, sit down and decide what to do with those changes. Um, for example, for you know, Napoleon found Germany divided into more than 300 states, and he left it in 1814 downsized to just three dozen states. So are we going to keep that change, right? Or are we, what are we going to do about these social and uh, economic reforms that Napoleon brought to various parts of Europe? Keep it or not? And if we're keeping, then what was the point of fighting Napoleon? If we're not keeping, then to what extent? And so they were already meeting in the Vienna the Congress of Vienna, which was Actually, one of the important reasons why Napoleon will be ultimately defeated because the great powers were already in one place. They had this ability to coordinate. And one of the first things that they did at the Congress of Vienna is they declared him an outlaw. That is, almost as soon, almost as soon as Napoleon returned, he is uh, declared an outlaw. If you read the declaration that the Congress of Vienna issued, it is quite interesting because they effectively declare war not on France, but on a single individual, which is quite interesting, right? He's had his declaration of war against one man. <laughs> uh, but it was done. He, he's, he's famously condemned as, as a, this is a quote, an enemy and disturber of the tranquility of the world. And so they say that we are not fighting the French people, but rather one man. So in fact, to, they're trying to divide uh, you know, the, 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 the French side, saying, hey, people, just calm down, sit at home. We only have a beef with this one dude. Let, it, let us handle him, and then you can go back to being your peaceful self. Uh, and so Napoleon, therefore, being after uh, realizing that there is war coming, he's facing a situation where he can mobilize at the most, uh, at the most, about 250,000 men. So that's the, the extent of the French uh, in a force that he can rely. But on the other hand, he's facing a combined efforts of European powers that can bring to bear close to a million men. Okay, so that's a massive disparity there. And of those powers, the ones that were able to respond first were the British, the Prussians, and their allies, Dutch allies uh, and the Belgian allies. And the army that the British and the Prussians had were deployed in the north in what is today Belgium, uh, in, in an effort to invade France from the north. At the same time, almost quarter million Austrian troops are mobilizing in the eastern part, and there's another quarter million of Russian forces that are being mobilized and being sent. Now, in order to for the Russians to get to France, of course, they had to cross most of Central, all, all of Central Europe. So it will take a few weeks for the Russians and Austrians to come. And that's where Napoleon's strategy was, I'm going to strike into Belgium and defeat the British and the Prussians. That's where he wants that decisive battle. Because by defeating these two powers, he hopes to split the coalition and then find a way to negotiate with the other two. And one of the things that gives him this kind of hope is that, remember that he's married to an Austrian princess. So the Austrians have this kind of connection to him. And Napoleon also is aware that when the great powers were meeting in Vienna and talking about re restructuring Europe, that there was a lot of uh, disagreements among them. In fact, disagreements to such a degree that Austria and Britain were uh, willing to confront, militarily confront Prussia and Russia over the issue of German partitioning. So there are disagreements between the uh, allies. And Napoleon, by striking into Belgium and defeating at least the British, maybe British and the Prussians, hopes to splinter it. So basically, so that the same thing doesn't happen again, that in the movie, you see him almost getting surrounded in Paris by all, all these different forces, and that's trying to not let history repeat itself. <laughs> that's right, because in, in 1814, uh, this combined coalition invaded France from multiple directions, and Napoleon was simply overwhelmed through sheer numbers, because he actually fights one of the best campaigns of his life, in the early spring of 1814, with a small army, he can outmaneuver these allies and famously scores six victories in one week. But he only has so many troops. The allies have a vast superiority in numbers. And he knows that's the same scenario is going to play out in 1815. And he wants to anticipate that by 
uh, seizing the initiative. There is a scene in the movie where the movie explains why it happens. The battle actually happens at Waterloo. And according to that scene, after Wellington found out Napoleon crossed the border at Charleroi, he believes Napoleon will go toward, we see a map and they're all kind of strategizing there. You see four roads by Catabra and Wellington decides that he's going to confront Napoleon at nearby Waterloo. Is that a pretty accurate reason for why the battle ended up taking place at Waterloo? Yes, I think it's uh, pretty close. Now, I do want to mention that the movie has a wonderful reconstruction of the famous ball that the British were attending. This was uh, a ball uh, given at the Dutch by Richmond, and the British military elite is attending there. There are women, their wives, there are, you know, this quite a charming atmosphere, and the men are dancing, and this, uh, you know, they, they anticipate the war, of course. But this is essentially the last hurrah before you know the the, the fighting begins, and there's this kind of love and, and cho- you know joy still is still in the air. And uh, Christopher Plummer is uh, to me he's is a perfect Wellington, and he's he's a place him quite well. And you see this news arriving, right? And you see this stark impact of the news that Napoleon has crossed the border and is invading Belgium, and you see quick reaction. Right where the soldiers have to leave and to go, you know this stark moment where the women are all you know left alone and the men leave, and then uh, I love the scene when Wellington is meeting with his officers, as you've said, and they look over the map and they see how Napoleon is moving. And what Napoleon did is when he struck into Belgium, he carefully calculated to position himself between the British and the Prussian armies, and that was part of his. This kind of classical Napoleonic strategy, uh, we, we refer to it as the strategy of central position. By getting into the center and splitting your opponents, you can handle them separately. And that's what Napoleon wants. And he actually is able to do it. And uh, I love in the movie where Wellington uh, says, I have been humbugged, uh, according to the eyewitnesses. That's an actual quote, because he realized that Napoleon seized the initiative and he managed to achieve that first success of central positioning and now he can keep these allies separate but in order to for napoleon to then achieve the second success he needs to engage the allies and defeat them and he focuses napoleon focuses his attention on the closest opponent and that is the prussian army led by this uh, remarkable kind of maverick uh, field marshal blucher Napoleon knows that Blucher's army will be converging on the city, on the town of Ligny. And so he decides to engage Blucher at Ligny. But he also wants to keep Wellington at bay so Wellington can't simply come and help the Prussians. And so it, it, as the battle at Ligny begins, Napoleon sends one of his units, one of his corps under Marshal Ney, towards the town of Quarterbrook. And the Quarterbra had this crucial crossing, uh, a crossroads of several roads converging. And then one of the roads was coming from Brussels, but it was also another uh, a road that was would have allowed the French to flank, to turn the flank of the Prussian army at Ligny. If the French had secured that cross, uh, that crossroads, the Prussians would have been in a really uh, bad uh, situation. But Wellington pr- correctly anticipates this move. And therefore, he responds by rushing to the crossroads. And here we see these twin battles taking place simultaneously uh, between French and the Prussians at Ligny and the French and the British at Quarterbra. And uh, un- unfortunately for the French, while they gain victory at Ligny and the Prussian army is indeed badly mauled, they can't win at Quarterbra. In the movie, I think we see kind of an aftermath of a battle where Napoleon talks about 16,000 dead Prussians. Is that the battle that, that you're talking about there? That We didn't really see the battle itself in the movie, but we kind of see the aftermath of it. Yes, and correctly so. I think the, the movie makers, you know, Bondarchuk, uh, Sergei Bondarchuk, who directed this movie, made the correct decision because it would have been a bit repetitive to have the same kind of you know, battle scenes that would have, you know, the focus clearly here and correctly so was on Waterloo and showing the fighting at, at Ligny or Quarterbra would, would have been just uh, redundant. But the, the illusion is indeed to these two battles. We know that at Ligny, 
the Prussians were defeated. They were thrown back. And uh, in fact, their commander in chief, Luher, was uh, uh, thrown off the horse and the horse fell on top of him. So he was actually badly bruised and he could have been and was very close to being captured by the French. And who knows how history would have turned out if they had succeeded at this. But as it was, Blucher evaded the capture. And here he makes, an, uh, he and his, his staff, uh, you know, he has a, a cadre of very capable Prussian officers advising him. And they made a very important decision. Now, after you defeat like at Lini, uh, your natural inclination is to retreat along what military calls the lines of communication, lines of supply, meaning, you know, you go back the way you came. So to keep this supply system, you know, keep, you know, still behind you. But what the Prussians decided in the wake of Lini was instead of retreating along the line of communication, to wear off of it, to turn left of it and go north and then west to support their British allies, which is a very important decision because that is a decision that will lead to the French defeat at Waterloo. Speaking of the Battle of Waterloo, we're kind of getting to that point in the movie where the battle is about to start. But before we actually get into the battle itself, I want to ask you about some key things for how the movie sets up the battle. Uh, first, there was a brief line. I remember hearing someone on the English side saying that counting the French, there are some 140,000 men, but they also expect that some 40,000 will be dead by the next day. Another key thing the movie suggests is a big factor is the mud, which the French think will make it very difficult to move their cannons efficiently. And lastly, we see Napoleon sweating really bad the night before the battle, and there are growing concerns about his health. How well does the movie do setting up some of these key elements leading up to the Battle of Waterloo? Actually, all of this is historically correct. Uh, maybe you know we can quibble about specific details, but o- overall, the movie does well in conveying this broad historical narrative. To start with the uh, uh, the size of the armies, we know that Napoleon had about 73,000 men at Waterloo. That includes about 50,000 infantry, about 15,000 uh, cavalry, and you know 10,000 or so artillery and the support troops. On the other side, we know that the, uh, Wellington had about 68,000, and the Prussians would arrive later in the day but uh, they would bring about 50,000. So the Allies, if combined, which is what exactly Napoleon wanted to prevent, would outnumber Napoleon, uh, essentially about roughly 120,000 against 73,000. But separately, Napoleon will outnumber these individual Allied armies. In terms of weather, we know that after uh, Battle of Ligny, which is fought on June 16, there was indeed the downpour. I mean, really uh, like a stormy weather that will go through, it will rain. And uh, it has a, a, a direct impact on the battle because the battlefield uh, between the villages of uh, Belle Alliance and you know, Waterloo, it, it, this massive battlefield is, is soggy. It's hard to move, but it's also uh, it's a problematic for the artillery. In this movie and other movies, oftentimes we see this, you know, the artillery shell just exploding, right? That's not particularly true. Uh, unless you are shooting an you know, explosive shell, which uh, m- most of the time they didn't. The idea was that the artillery cannonball, that solid cannonball, once it's fired, would bounce off the ground and hit the target. You know, if, if it doesn't hit straight, but will bounce off the t- uh, ground. And that ricochet effect was actually quite dangerous because the direction of the cannonball, once it hit the ground, was unpredictable, and it could bounce repeatedly. And it still maintained this momentum that could easily kill men. But you can't achieve that if you have a soggy ground. The cannonball will just simply stuck in the ground. And so Napoleon knows about this. And on the day of the battle, on June 18, he makes a decision to wait for the ground to dry. And so he waits until about 11 o'clock. And, uh, uh, of course, in hindsight, we know that that was a, uh, a, a, an important decision because had he started earlier, had the ground been dry, he would have started early in the days as all of his battles uh, started. Think about Austerlitz started before dawn. Uh, Borodino started with a sunrise, right? But here, because he waited effectively four or five hours, he doesn't have those four or five hours in the afternoon when the Prussians are coming. And so that played a role. As, in terms of health, 
we know that Napoleon was not feeling well. In fact, that's actually one of the interesting things about him is that at the crucial moments of his life, at places like uh, when he fights the Russians on the outskirts of Moscow at Borodino or, or, or at, at, uh, at Leipzig and now at Waterloo, he feels unwell. He feels sick, and uh, some refer to that he had piles, some that he was, you know, he caught cold, but he clearly was not himself. And the movie shows well this moment when he both sweats, but he also delegates a lot of decisions, right? He he doesn't go out there, you know, like at, at Auschwitz, where he actually went around and examined and cheered and all. And here uh, he's in the back, and oftentimes he's more of a responsive, and reactive to events rather than seizing the initiative. You mentioned something that I wanted to ask about because in the movie we see Napoleon's tactics for actually starting the battle is to launch an attack near Hougoumont on the right side of the English forces. And the impression that I got was he wanted to, like you mentioned, like, split, basically hoping that Wellington would take men from the center, move them over to the right side, and then he could Napoleon would have an advantage there being able to split the uh, Wellington's men. Was that his tactic to to start the battle there, essentially trying to split Wellington and then Wellington, according to the movie at least, he didn't fall for it? That's right. Bear in mind, this is the first time Napoleon confronts Wellington. So here you have these two great commanders of the age, probably the most talented commanders of, the, of this period facing each other. Now, Wellington achieved great success fighting the French in the Iberian Peninsula, in Portugal and Spain. And uh, marshals that Napoleon sent to fight Wellington were repeatedly dropped by him. So they had this experience of dealing with Wellington. In fact, they warned Napoleon of, of Wellington's abilities and especially his, his tactical prowess. But Napoleon, because he never confronted him, he never, uh, you know, fought him, uh, and this was the first kind of appearance in a showdown between them. He, I think, underestimated Wellington, and especially when we look at how carefully Wellington deployed his off positions, or, or, you know, troops on the positions. Napoleon couldn't really see Wellington's army because the Wellington deployed it on these reverse slopes of the heights of these hills on the battlefield. And so he could only see some of those troops, but not what behind the heights, which is, in, was ingenious for Wellington to do so. And so what he decides then, what Napoleon decides, is that he wants to strike on the left uh, towards the Chateau Hougamont by effectively by pretending that this was the main attack. That, you know, he would pretend that he will try to smash the Wellington's left, uh, uh, Wellington's right flank. Uh, he will forced him to uh, commit reserves, because all commanders had reserves on this time. And so he would com make him commit reserves to his flank. And once that is achieved, Napoleon will then strike somewhere else, in the center, on the right, uh, 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 and, and, and achieve a breakthrough. So the attack on Hugamon was supposed to be a diversion, now, a, a, a strong diversion, because it, it needs to look like an actual major attack, but Napoleon visioned it as a diversion. To Wellington's credit, right, he reads through this, right? He understands what's happening. And so what he does is that he very skillfully keeps his right flank at Hugomont defended. And it's to the great credit of the British troops who so steadfastly held out in that chateau and you know, fought back. And so Wellington doesn't have to commit all of his reserves. He can just simply fit that flank in just enough support to keep it intact. So that when Napoleon indeed tries to attack him elsewhere, Wellington still has reserves, he still is ready to respond to them. According to the movie and the battle itself, we do see the tide turning a few different times. Uh, the cavalry, they call them the Scots Greys in the movie, they get routed by French lancers. And then Wellington orders his army to retire 100 paces. And the French cavalry see this and they, oh, they're retreating. They launch an attack without infantry support. And this ends up going badly. And then Napoleon is furious. Apparently, he was lying down for a time due to his illness. How well overall do you think the movie did showing the Battle of Waterloo itself? In Broad Swifts, it does very well. I mean, and, and all of this, this tide of war, you know, the tide of battle where you have the charge of the British heavy cavalry and then they 
Ney's infamous uh, cavalry charge, all of this are indeed uh, what happened. And there's this wonderful painting by Elizabeth Thompson of you know, the, char- the Scotland Forever that shows the charge of the Scots Grace. And I think the movie does excellent job in showing that famous charge and then what happened to it. Just imagine the scene of you know these two brigades of uh, combined strength of about two thousand men, They're led by this uh, you know forty seven year old uh, uh, Oxbridge right uh, shouting, and you see that in the battle, and it conveys the uh, the full power and awesomeness of the cavalry, uh, you know, bearing on you. And the movie also does a very good job. At showing you, maybe not explaining, but showing you Ney's countercharge, the famous uh, or infamous in many respects, uh, the decision that Ney had made to attack with some 67 squadrons uh, because he thought that the British were teetering on the edge of withdrawing or imploding the, in, in the line. And I think one of the most powerful scenes in the movie is the scene when the French cavalry begins to, to charge, and then you see the camera pan out, and you, it shows you these massive British squares on the reverse slope. And you can imagine this French uh, cavalry, right, charging up and then stumbling upon these squares. And uh, you cannot but wonder of how many of them <laughs> said, uh, you know, one of those, oh, merde, <laughs> you know. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> what we got in there? <laughs> <laughs> when, when you stumble upon it, because these squares are virtually impenetrable. They, there are very few cases of, of squares, disciplined uh, infantry formed in squares being penetrated and uh, dis- uh, broken. Into. And certainly not the not when you're dealing with a, uh, a superb military like the British one. There is uh, this beautiful scene, right, where you have uh, about 10 squares that the movie shows you, and the cavalry just circling around them and getting shot at uh, uh, before ultimately withdrawing. Now, we know that Napoleon was not involved in this decision, that in fact, they misjudged and uh, attacked. And Napoleon was indeed quite furious at it, but the damage was already done. Near the end of the battle in the movie, we see the French nearly win. There's even a scene where Napoleon tells Soult to write a letter back to Paris declaring that we've won the battle. No, we've won the war. <laughs> but then Bluer and the, and the Prussians show up and the battle just turns around and the French get routed. It turns into a massacre. One of the final scenes in the battle depicts a bunch of French soldiers being surrounded by the British and they refuse to surrender. And then they're gunned down by cannons. Is that a pretty accurate representation of how the battle ended? Yeah, but again, in broad sweeps, yes. So the movie a bit exaggerates in terms of the uh, maybe the the extent of the disarray of the British British war. And but Napoleon certainly by late afternoon expected to win this battle. He was uh, uh, in the position in the wake of capturing the core positions uh, uh, in the battlefield. Uh, for example, the capture of the La Haye uh, Sand. Uh, he expected that the uh, the center of Wellington's line will be uh, penetrated. And once that is achieved, then Wellington would have been forced to retreat. So without the Prussians arriving, uh, Wellington most probably would have been forced to fall back. Now, this would not have been a rout. It would not have been the defeat, or, you know, let's say, on the scale of uh, Napoleon drubbing Austrians and Russians at Austerlitz, but it would have been an, an important setback for the British. They would have been forced to retreat probably on the road to Brussels, and Napoleon would have been able to keep Prussians and the British separate, so who knows how things would have turned out. But here, that decision, the decision that Blucher and his uh, officers made after Ligny of not retreating, but rather committing to Wellington uh, to help at, at Waterloo, plays through. And here, I think the movie also does a good job of showing you how. You see the corps that Napoleon sent under the General Grouchy, essentially Marshal Grouchy, now he's just been promoted, under Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians towards uh, the city of Wavre. Uh, or you see this uh, army proceeding. Now, there is the famous story of this, you know, of Grouchy eating strawberries and uh, 
uh, and uh, hearing the cannonade at the in the distance coming from the direction of Waterloo, and these generals, uh, you know, General Gerard coming to him and saying, "Hey, you hear the cannonade? That's our guys fighting. We need to go," because one of the you know one of these unwritten rules of in the French army was to march to the sound of guns. Right? If you hear sound of guns, you go and help. And uh, the movie supposedly, you know, again shows you this Grouchy ignoring it. I think that's where you see it kind of, we can quibble uh, uh, at, at how a movie portrays it because Grouchy will be scapegoated for Waterloo. You know, he will be portrayed as the man responsible for it, that Napoleon has done everything right. And, you know, it, if not uh, for Grouchy and him eating strawberries, things would have turned out differently. The reality is a bit more complex. You know, Napoleon's uh, instructions to Grouchy were not clear enough. We can, you know, debate the extent or veracity of the movie's portrayal. But the core element the movie shows is correct, and that is Blue Hair will be able to evade Grouchy's core. And you see that striking moment when Napoleon is told about troops appearing on his flank, right, on his right flank, and he looks through the spying glass and he sees them coming up. He, he hopes that it's Grouchy, but it's actually Prussians. And you see this wonderful scene of you know, showing this Prussian army lining up. And you see these black flags right, with white crosses. It's a separate point of pride for myself that uh, the actor who is portraying uh, Blucher is a Georgian, a uh, very famous Georgian actor, Sergo Zakariadze. And he, uh, to me, he conveys this intensity of Blucher, who hated Napoleon with all the part of his being. I mean, he wanted this guy dead. And so he comes and there's this, moment when the close-up at blew her states and he says you know children right <laughs> show no mercy <laughs> and then it's charged that the prussians launch against the uh, french right flank napoleon tries desperately to redeploy to shore up this flank but uh, it's it's too late i mean the his army is quite tired he has been fighting for most of the day and here you have this fresh Prussian army, some 50,000 men that will come bearing down. Uh, and so he is he's defeated. The last scene of the battle, as you said, is the scene that probably is one of the most famous moments of Napoleonic Wars. And that is the last square, right, of this Imperial Guard. Uh, the way the movie shows is, is kind of romanticized. And, of course, the, the battlefield experience would have been different. Not the least, you know, this whole, uh, you know, cavalry surrounding the square and then cavalry yeah. separating and surprise. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, I can't, yeah. Yeah, say hello to the little <laughs> friend. <laughs> the cannon rolls out. But I think it conveys this dramatic effect of the determination of the guard to fight to the end, uh, or at least some units, because we know that the guard did fall back. In fact, one of the moments in the battle is... Uh, is when the news so, uh, spreads among the French army that, you know, la garde est couille, you know, the guard retreats, and that was kind of breaking the spirit of the French army that, oh my God, if the guard is retreating, that's it, the battle is lost. There is also this wonderful moment in that scene, in that last scene, when uh, these French are offered to surrender, and you see the officer, you know, supposedly this General Cambron, who, uh, uh, you know, so uh, there is a debate whether he indeed said these words, but in some, you know, the legend tells us that he says, you know, the guard dies but never surrenders. But in most, I think, the sources that we can, I think, trust and, and uh, he probably simply said, oh, shit, you know, merd. He was ultimately captured uh, and he would be in captivity and many of the guardsmen will die and perish uh, in this last stages of the battle. Waterloo is is the brutal affair. I mean, it is quite a disaster for the French. Um, to give, I, I think it is one of the most heaviest defeats the French have suffered during the Napoleonic Wars. I mentioned that the French army starts with about seventy three thousand men. The battle claims close to forty four thousand casualties. I mean, it's a staggering drubbing. There is a significant losses on the Allied side. Uh, Wellington's army lost about 24,000 men. Blucher's army, again, arrives late in the day, but plays a crucial role in defeating French, but it still lost about 7,000 men. 
so the totals are quite significant. So in in, in total, in, in one day affair, we see here some sixty five thousand men killed and butchered and wounded. You remember that famous scene when when the cannonball struck one of the uh, British, one of the Wellington's officers, and tore his leg off. Right. I think the film does well in conveying the brutality of, of this battle, the sheer carnage that uh, the early 19th century uh, battle indeed was. Well, that leads right into my next question, because at the very end of the movie, we do see how the two main characters with Wellington and Napoleon kind of changed over the course of the events in the movie. In the, in the beginning, you mentioned at, at the ball, while he was there, he said something to the effect of how he expects his soldiers to die for him simply because it's their duty. But then at the end, there's a couple of lines, you know, I hope to God I've fought my last battle and next to a battle lost, the saddest thing is a battle won. And then as far as Napoleon is concerned, you can tell just that the the loss just weighs very heavily on him. We don't see a lot of really what happens to him. He just kind of gets in a carriage and rides away. But what was the aftermath of the battle at Waterloo and how did it affect Napoleon and Wellington? Yeah, I think that's one of the, these powerful scenes for me uh, of the movie, uh, the way it shows the aftermath. We, oftentimes we have these romanticized notions, right, of war, of battles. Especially in, the, in historical narratives, we talk about the battles in, in the sense of the glorious heroic exploits. And few of us contemplate what it was like to look at the battlefield that would be covered by you know, 60,000 bodies, dead and wounding and dying and calling for help and you know, thirsting because the, one of the uh, problems these uh, soldiers often had because they had to fire so many times uh, during the battle and you know bite those cartridges and have their gunpowder in their mouth and this talk of their mouth being black from the gunpowder and this gunpowder you know you know it's being salty and they all are thirsting and just the sheer human experience of it and I think the movie shows you uh, the scene when the, the the camera pans out and you see indeed. You know, Wellington is sort of looking uh, at, at this battlefield covered in, in dead and dying. Uh, it also shows you the, um, you know, them trying to already clean the battlefield by line or arranging these lines of dead. And, uh, and there's uh, also these scavengers who are going around. In fact, one of the interesting tidbits of Waterloo is that after the battle, there was a lot of scavenging done and not necessarily in terms of items being stolen, but one of the things that the people did was they went around and they removed the teeth of the dead because there was a massive demand for dentures in Europe. And if you're a dentist, you need, uh, you know, you can have like Washington had those wooden <laughs> dentures. <laughs> not, not cool, not particularly cool looking. Or you can have... An, you know, really the top of the line, real teeth. Oh, they're hard to procure from and it, unless you have access to this mass, mass quantities of the dead. Indeed, in the wake of the Waterloo, there was a phenomenon that was called the Waterloo teeth. Uh, this glut, really, the glut of teeth that comes on the market with so many of the teeth were produced from the teeth from the dead of, of Waterloo. And you can actually look it up uh, because there's this quite interesting surviving pieces of dentures that floated for many years after Waterloo. I think the scene with Napoleon retreating from Waterloo is quite powerful because on one hand, he's, he's uh, I don't think he's repentant, right? He's kind of, he doesn't show that kind of remorse that you see uh, in Wellington. Napoleon indeed retreats from Waterloo to Paris. He's, I mean, the movie exaggerates the extent of his illness in many respects, but I think that's one of those literary licenses that movie makers can take. The eyewitnesses talk about him unfeeling unwell, but the extent of that uh, uh, Ill illness might have been exaggerated in the movie. But we know that he was exhausted, kind of. And you see that scene in the carriage when he sits and the carriage goes away. Now, the carriage will take him to Paris, but he will not be able to stay in Paris because. By the time he gets to Paris, there is an internal coup underway uh, once the news of Waterloo reaches. 
and he's again ousted from power, and he fears that he will be captured and or detained. So he moves away from Paris to a small town, and there he contemplates what to do next. Now, the movie doesn't show you this, but ultimately he makes a decision to go to the coastline of France, not really knowing for sure what to do, because there are plan, at least plans for him to escape the United States. Uh, uh, and so he goes to this port town, to a small island of eight, and by the time he gets there, the port is blockaded by the British ship. And so he's, he will stay for a few weeks there, for a few days, you know, contemplating what to do. The locals will offer him fastest ships that might evade the British blockade and take him to the United States. I mean, one cannot but wonder what he would have done <laughs> during him showing up in Philadelphia or Boston. <laughs> History would have been different. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, I live in Louisiana, so maybe he should have come to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, but the, the ultimately, as we know, he will surrender to the British. And the British will then make it this uh, momentous decision of sending him into second exile on a remote island, far more remote than Elba. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not going to make that st- mistake again. <laughs> yeah, not going to be a full of doing a full of once, <laughs> but not second time. So he was sent to this remote uh, volcanic rock in the middle of Atlantic, uh, some uh, 4,000 miles from Europe, uh, where Napoleon will spend the last six years of his life. Uh, under the protection of the British troops. Is there anything that you wish they had included in the movie that didn't make it in? No, to me, I think the movie works overall. I mean, I consider it one of the best kind of military movies, especially certainly one of the best Napoleonic movies. I mean, the sheer production value is huge. I mean, Sergei Bondarchuk, the Soviet director who was involved in making in this movie, has uh, directed the War and Peace and anyone who's lived through the nine hours or whatever, <laughs> how long the length of that movie is, knows the, the grandiose scale of the production, which Wonder Chuk now brought to Waterloo. You see here, you know, thousands of extras. I mean, the terms of production is superb. I really appreciate the way they structure. The pace is quite well. And even though, again, from a historical point of view, you can quibble about details of, you know, they skipped that and they didn't elaborate this. And you're right in pointing out that, you know, they rushed through the opening scenes of you know, the campaign where it all was done in a sentence. But I think for the movie purpose, the narrative is sustained. And most crucially, they did excellent job in, in casting. I mean, Rod Steiger as Napoleon, I, I don't think anyone can beat him, really. I mean, that's that's the golden standard now. And Christopher Plummer and one of his best roles as Wellington. Uh, and we oftentimes forget that Orson Welles, one of the great actors of the age, uh, is in this remarkable role of Louis XVIII, where he's, <laughs> he's shown gaining this massive weight, right? He can barely move. There are so many wonderful, wonderful actors involved in it. So to me, there's little that you can improve on this. Thank you so much for coming on to chat about Waterloo. I know your most recent book is called The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, but you've written a number of fantastic books on the Napoleonic era. For someone listening to this who wants to learn more, can you give an overview of your books and a recommendation for which one to start with? Thank you so much for mentioning about my books. Um, I, might, I tend to focus on the other of Napoleon's campaigns, the earlier ones, I'm a bit of Francophile, so Waterloo campaign is a <laughs> painful one to contemplate. I've written uh, extensively on, on Napoleon's um, uh, invasion of Russia, so on battles at Borodino and Berezina. But uh, for the listeners interested in the Battle of Waterloo, there's wonderful new work that has appeared in the last 10 years or so by Andrew Field, by Paul Dawson, by Charles Estale, that really reevaluated the battle, for a long time, the battle used to be portrayed from more of a French or British point of view, but now we see the battle considered from multiple points of view. Edmund Murjic, for example, a Dutch uh, historian, uh, showed us how crucial Dutch contribution to this battle was. 
the Dutch are only glimpsed <laughs> in this movie, but they played a crucial role at Quadra. They contributed at Waterloo. And there is this wonderful series that Gareth Glover is editing, a British historian, entitled Waterloo Archive. Now, I think six volumes, six massive volumes of bringing eyewitness accounts to show us the depth and complexity of this battle from so many you know, points of view. And the you know listeners can read those accounts and then compare it to the movie. And I think the comparison will be quite positive. Thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have fun watching the movie. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Alexander Mika Berlita once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 1970s Waterloo. Now, if you want to learn even more about Napoleon, definitely go check out Alexander's body of work. He's got some great books that dive deep into Napoleon's campaigns, including his latest book, which is called The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History. As always, you can find links to that book and more of his work on the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on truestorypodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our true truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the true truths and one lie. Number one, casualties for Napoleon's army at Waterloo tallied up to over half of his army. Number two, Napoleon was still an emperor when he was exiled to Elba. Number three, Napoleon was mortally wounded at the Battle of Waterloo. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Casualties for Napoleon's army at Waterloo tallied up to over half of his army. That is true. As Alexander pointed out, Napoleon had about 73,000 soldiers at the Battle of Waterloo. And by the time it was over, there were some 44,000 casualties. That's about 60% of his men, and that doesn't even count the tens of thousands who died on the other side of the battle. In all, over 60,000 were killed in a single day. That brings us to number two. Napoleon was still an emperor when he was exiled to Elba. That is also true. We learned that when Napoleon was defeated and exiled in 1814, he was allowed to retain the title of emperor it was just over the tiny island of Elba. He was even allowed a small army and some ships. That means number three is the lie Napoleon was mortally wounded at the Battle of Waterloo. As Alexander explained, after his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon managed to flee, but he was eventually captured. He wasn't injured, but this time he was exiled to a much more remote location, and that's where he lived out the remainder of his days. And that just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each and every episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. And I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm sharing this information. Now, if there's one thing that's really surprising to a lot of people when they're new to podcasting or they've never created a podcast before, they're always surprised at just how much time it takes to create them. So I figure maybe if you find out how much time and effort goes into creating a podcast like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all of the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 37 hours to create and cost $21.13 in out-of-pocket expenses. Now, as I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 37 hours obviously doesn't include the years of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about. It also does not include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that aren't really part of creating this one single episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain based on truestorypodcast.com, the podcast website, the social media for the podcast, the email newsletter, all of those other little things that are outside creating this one episode about Waterloo, but it's still required to make the overall podcast. Similarly, on the expenses side, that $21.13 is just for things specifically related to this one episode. It doesn't include all of the podcast-related expenses that go beyond this episode. For example, the microphone that I'm talking into right now, the cables that are hooked up to the microphone, the audio interface, the computer that's recording this, the software, 
the podcast and website hosting costs and on and on. There's a lot of costs that go into creating an overall show that go beyond just creating this one episode about Waterloo. All of those things take time to set up and maintain and they cost money and that goes beyond things that are associated with this one episode, but they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there would not be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast is free to listen to, but it is not free to create, far from it. And that is why I am so thankful for the wonderful people who are helping to support this show financially so we can keep it going. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to over 60 exclusive episodes on the producer's feed. Over there, we look at how completely fictional movies deal with history and real life to make them seem a little bit more believable. For example, we've covered the history in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. Did you know there really was a pirate code? It wasn't anything like what we see in the movie, of course, but it never is, is it? And there's more. Uh, Jurassic Park, the entire Back to the Future franchise, the entire Mummy franchise. Next week, we'll be looking at National Treasure, Book of Secrets, and there's so many more. You can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.